Confidence, mentoring, and communication, oh my, three critical factors of becoming a successful civil engineering professional. In this week's episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, I'm thrilled to have with us Danielle Goodrow, a young civil engineering project manager who's going to talk about all of those things, her career journey, how her internships helped her, how she had to build confidence to get out there and she continues to cultivate it. She also gives some really interesting thoughts on mentorship and how it can really help you in a way that a lot of people don't necessarily think about. With that, let's jump right into this week's episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast. All right, now I'm excited to welcome our guest onto the podcast today, Danielle Goudreau. Danielle, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So Danielle, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you. I introduced you to our audience earlier, but in your own words, maybe you could just tell us what it is that you do on a daily basis at Collins Engineers. Sure. Uh, so one thing I will say is that what I do on a daily basis varies day to day. Uh, one day I might be doing design calculations and the other day I might be out in the field. Uh, my title is project manager now, but it's not strictly what I do, um, which keeps it in keeps things exciting you know yeah for sure i mean uh, but, project manager could mean a host of things right i mean especially when you manage civil projects that have a million different things going on absolutely there's so many different facets um within civil engineering but also within every single project that you work on um so like i said one day i'll be doing calculations the other day i'll be in the field but i also get to do inspections and construction observation um it's exciting. Everything is different. And that's what makes me love civil engineering is that it's, it's always a new challenge. And so what's the general area you, you would say that you practice in if someone asked you? I would call it waterfront engineering. Um, but within waterfront engineering, I would call myself a pseudo geotech pseudo structural engineer. Um, because those two facets of civil engineering are really what encompasses waterfront. Um, a lot of what I do, I have retaining walls because the water has to meet the land somewhere, whether that's a beach or a structure. Um, so a lot of what I do is earth retaining structures. I also do a lot of pile supported piers, that type of stuff. So it's geotech and structural. Um, they work closely together on any type of project, but specifically within waterfront, I, I get to do a little both of those, which is what I like. That's great. I mean, I, I, I tend to think that that's one of the cool things about civil engineering is when someone asks you what you do, you can kind of be like, well, it's not that straightforward. I mean, I really, you know, contribute to the built environment. I'm doing a lot of different things. Um, my wife is a geotechnical engineer as well, uh, or she does that as well, but she's also now working in water resources and working on wells and stuff. So I feel like you get a lot of different things as a civil engineer, which is kind of one of the things that makes it really interesting and ensures that you're not, you know, things aren't boring and that your things are getting changed up basically every day. Absolutely. And as you move forward in your career, your path may change a little bit. Um, so you, you might start your career as a geotech and end as water resources. I also know people who got a mechanical engineering degree and they ended up in the civil engineering field. Um, so there, there's so much that you can do, but getting to do both geotech and structural um, has helped me understand both sides of the coin, um, but it, it just also keeps things interesting. Yeah, that's great. And, and that's kind of a message for all of you out there listening that are in the civil world, but maybe aren't completely thrilled or passionate about the specific role you're playing right now in your career, you know, there are things you can probably do, probably, you know, a hundred different things you can do and still stay in the civil field that may be more interesting to you. So there's always, you know, things to, and that's one of the goals of the podcast is to open you up to different aspects of civil engineer, civil engineering and different people in the world. So you can kind of get different flavor. And this, this episode specifically, Danielle, is one of the episodes in our women in civil engineering series that's been pretty popular. We've got a lot of, um, a lot of really positive feedback, just trying to highlight some women in the field. And we do know that women that are in traditionally, you know, male heavy fields, such as engineering can face some pretty difficult hurdles. What would you say just from your experience, having some of the difficulties of being a woman in a field that, you know, does still have a lot more men in it? So one thing I will say is that I, I haven't met a, a single female engineer who hasn't had their own story, whatever it is. Um, but at the end of the day, we go into work every day, whether it's in the field or in the office, and we're there to do our job. And when I go into the office, 
I don't see myself as different from my male counterparts. And I, I really think that that's, that's the mindset that you need to have because you're not different whatsoever. Um, some people might see you different, but that's their problem and that, that's not your problem. Um, you made a choice as to what your career wanted to be. I chose that I wanted to work on waterfront structures because they're really cool. I get to go out on the water and I get to design things. And I think that's pretty awesome. Um, but I would say that, you know, the small percentage of situations that you might run into um, is not a day to day. It's, it's maybe 1% of the population that, that might say something to you, but you know, you don't let that affect you and you don't let it distract you. Yeah, that's great. And, and I'd ask you just a follow up question on that, because wh I think what you said is really valuable is that you go in, you know, and you have the mindset, I'm just like everyone else here, I'm here to do my job. However, I do know just from talking with a lot of women in civil engineering that, you know, it's not necessarily that easy to have that mindset. And I think maybe you need to cultivate some confidence to be able to maintain that mindset, you know, throughout your career. Is there something that you did or was there something that gave you confidence to be able to keep that mindset kind of throughout your career? It sounds like you're really confident in that. And that's something that you bring to the table every day for yourself. Was that just something that you cultivated over time or did you always just feel really comfortable with that mindset? Um, I would say, you know, it, it, it happens over time. Just civil engineering in, in general, it, it can be nerve wracking starting any type of career. Um, but the thing is, is, is you went to school and you studied for four years, five years, however long you went to school for, and, and you earned that degree. You don't just get a degree, you earn a degree, like everyone else in your class. So you need to realize that you deserve it. You're there for a reason and you're there to do a job. And, you know, it, it can be hard sometimes, it can be nerve wracking, but I think it's the same as, as anyone else. Um, my male counterparts, they're nervous when they go on a job site and they're nervous when they start a new job. Heck, I was nervous when I started my first job when I was 16 years old. So it's it's going to be nerve wracking at first, but you're there for a reason. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's a great mindset. And I hope our listeners can, you know, really try to adopt that if you haven't already. But because I, I do know that it can be challenging at times. And Danielle, just roughly, how many years have you been practicing now out of school? I graduated in 2015. Um, I stayed an extra year to get my master's, but while I was getting my master's degree, I, I worked full time. So it's been a little over five years now. Great. And I want to talk to you. I know you're a big proponent of internships and I know you had internships and I think it's a really important thing. In fact, our last episode, I focused a little bit about, you know, the landscape for civil engineers right now when they graduate. Obviously, we're coming over this pandemic and there's a lot of stuff going on. I get a lot of questions about should I go to grad school? Should I get a job? And so I was talking through that a little bit. And one thing, regardless of how you answer that question, it's it, there's no doubt that internships can play a critical role in getting your career off to a good start and also how you can function as a civil engineer because of that early experience. Can you talk a little bit about you know your thought on internships and some of the experiences that you had, kind of how they impacted you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to get a diverse, uh, a broad range of experience. Um, number one, because, you know, when, when you're in school, you don't really realize, I think, right away, or most people don't realize right away how they want the rest of their career to look. And you might still not realize when you start your first job, you know. So I think it's important to get internships in different facets of engineering and different facets of or different organizations, whether it's, you know, you work for the state or you work for a federal agency, a private company, a construction company, uh, you really need to figure out what you wanna do. Um, so my first internship, um, I worked for a state DOT, a Department of Transportation. So I had the opportunity to work for the state, but I also got to do some construction experience and some bridge experience. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I knew I liked structural, but did I like bridges? I'm not sure. So I, I did that, I worked in the field, and then my second internship was for a dredging company. So for that one, I actually got to fly out to Texas, which was really cool, um, and I got to be on a dredge for a month. And it was one of those jobs where it's uh, one month on and two weeks off type of deal. It was cool because it was a large company and you can you know fly all over the world. And if that's something you wanna do, that's great. And then my third internship, I worked at a small uh, multidisciplinary civil engineering firm. So they had transportation, they had civil, uh, geotech, structural, pretty much everything. And I, that's when I really started with waterfront structures. Uh, but at the time, I, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. 
Um, but my third internship really uh, helped me decide that I want to work for a small firm. I like the feeling of that. Um, I, I don't really want to travel too much. I want to travel every now and again, but it's not something that I want to do on a consistent basis. But basically just the title. And I think it's important to get a broad range of experience to realize what you want, but also on the other side of that, uh, just to become a more well-rounded engineer. You know, I, I got the opportunity to work on bridges, so I have that base knowledge. Um, and I got to, I have the opportunity to uh, work in construction. So I have that base knowledge too for my internship. That's great. And what I really like about your internships, Danielle, is it gave you a really broad experience in that you worked for a public agency. So you got to see that side of it in, in terms of how they work on projects and whether or not you would like to work like that going forward. You got you got really you know thrown out into a field project, literally flew somewhere, stayed somewhere. So you got that field experience, which I think is super critical for younger civil engineers to experience. And then you got the private you know, the small private firm experience as well. So you really had a good range of, of opportunities to help you navigate what I think is a pretty complicated decision as a young civil engineering graduate, because there's so many different things you can do. I'm wondering how the internship experiences, if at all, um, informed your decision of getting a master's degree in terms of whether or not to get it and, and if you should specialize in it. Can you talk about your decision to get the master's degree? Yeah, so I was on the fence about whether or not I wanted to pursue it um, because at the time I was like, well, I just, I really want to start making money. I want to get out into the workforce um, and I, I really want to start. But at the same time, I, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So completing internships while I was in my graduate program, I think was paramount to ultimately deciding what I wanted to do with my career. Um, because I got to work on these projects while I was also learning the back end knowledge on, on how to complete those design calculations for the project. Um, so it, it really pushed me in the direction of, of waterfront structures because for my graduate degree, I decided to look at structural and geotech. Um, and while I was working on the classwork, I got to apply that to my uh, actual work during my internships. So. I, I think that's really what drove me in that direction and not, you know, it, you can always start grad school after you graduate as well. Um, not everyone knows what they want to do uh, after they graduate with their undergrad degree and not everyone necessarily wants to spend that money if they still don't know what they want to do. I, I, I was lucky because I kind of, you know, found an internship, but I, I think that everyone has that opportunity to find an internship and, and figure out what they want to do. No one's path is going to be the same. So whether you do your graduate degree right after your undergrad and you have an internship, great. Or if you wait five years um, and then you're working for a company and you realize that it would benefit you in the end to learn some additional knowledge specific to your career, that's great too. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's exactly kind of what I was getting at was, you know, some, for some people that aren't crystal clear on what they want to do. Maybe they didn't get the right internships. They may not want to jump into that graduate degree until they get some working experience and understand if they are going geotech or structural or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> Everyone's situation is really different. And also just, a, a, this is also for, we have, you know, we have experienced civil engineers that listen to the show. They might be, they might own small companies. And if you're advising your younger engineers on whether or not to get a master's degree, Again, you should talk to them about their experiences to date, how good they feel about the industry they're in, the discipline they're in, and you know maybe convince them to try some project work before it. Especially if you're going to be financially supporting that master's degree, I think you should you know kind of talk to them about that and give them a little bit of guidance on that. So, with that, Danielle, I want to switch gears a little bit, and I want to talk a little bit about project management. Your title is project manager, but like we talked about, that can mean many different things. But what I'd like to ask you about here is kind of something, again, for those experienced engineers that are thinking about promoting someone to project manager, but also for those who are about to be promoted to project manager, what are some of the things that you, you know, should be prepared to experience as a project manager? Because it's kind of one of those things you can, it can happen quickly and, you know, you kind of may or may not be prepared prepared for some of the things that come along with that title. How was that transition for you? And what were some things you, you would like to share about it? Sure. So I actually just began this role. 
So it's a little new for me too, but I, I will say that before you become a project manager, you want to be cognizant of, of your hours and um, how you're spending time on a project and the direction of the project. Um, before you become a project manager, you want to sit down with your current project manager and, and talk about how certain projects are moving forward and what the steps are to get to the, the next task. Um, because ultimately, when you become a project manager, it's, it's your responsibility or the outcome of the project is your responsibility. Right. So be cognizant of those things before you get that promotion. Make sure you're on top of your hours. Um, I recommend always asking what the budget is and always asking how much time you should be spending on something. Obviously, um, you, if something needs to get done, it needs to get done. But uh, you just need to be aware. Um, be aware of your budget. Be aware of the ultimate project goals um, because you you want to find uh, you want to find a balance between the goals and the budget. Yeah, so always be aware of the project and the budget, but also the ultimate goals, um, because you want to make sure the goal is aligned with with the budget and uh, what the client's uh, ultimate goal is. Yeah, that's great. And I think for those of you listening that, again, from both sides of the coin, if you're someone who's going to promote people to project manager, and you're going to assume the role of a project manager. I think understanding some of those key project management <clears throat> concepts like scope, schedule, and budget are really important to know. And if you can get a primer in that, if your company maybe offers a project management training or something along those lines, it can be very helpful for you. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is people get kind of thrust into project management and it's kind of like learn on the job. And that's really difficult to do. I mean, it's really hard to do. I, I tend, sometimes I use the analogy with people is like you're telling someone you're going to send them to another country to work on a project and they need to tomorrow and they need to start learning the language. Like it's just, it's too late. Like I don't have time. So, <clears throat> so that's something just to think about from the project management side of things. The other topic that I wanted to kind of ask you about, Danielle, is I know you, you've had a lot of field experience, which as I mentioned earlier, I think is really important to being successful in the world of civil engineering. It gives you the real practical knowledge of how things get built, which can help you, of course, in the office and managing projects. And I think it's really critical. And I do know that, you know, again, as I said earlier, my wife has had a lot of field experience. And I know it can, can be a little challenging sometime for a woman going onto a project site. Um, again, a lot of the, the laborers, a lot of people on the site will be men, um, you know, and I'm just wondering how that experience was for you and how you got comfortable in the field. Yeah, so I'll say the first couple of times going out in the field is is nerve wracking for anyone. I mean, you're you're new to this, and um, it's it's a big deal to go out in the field. You know, it's it's applying those those not that knowledge and those paper skills to the field and the construction of your project. Um, I will say, you know, we've been talking about confidence. I I think that you need to be confident going into the field and know your worth. Um, because again, you earned that degree. Uh, you're you're the design professional. That's ultimately what it is, is you're the design professional and the contractor is the construction specialist. Um, and I think it's it's really about building mutual respect and uh, having an active role in construction. It's how to help build that confidence. Uh, ask a lot of questions. I don't think that there's any such thing as a stupid question. You know, when, when I'm out in the field for the geotech stuff that I work on, um, I always ask the contractor questions because, you know, they've, they've been doing this for years and years. So, for example, if, if we're doing pile driving for a pier um, and we're hitting what I think might be obstructions, but I'm not really sure because you, the pile is is not moving down any farther and you know you're just hammering it into the ground but it's not going anywhere i'll ask the contractor what do you think this is do you think this is an obstruction do you think that we've hit bedrock is there you know ask those kind of questions and more than likely they're going to have either an answer or a pretty good opinion of what's going on so ask those questions and develop that relationship and i would say creating that mutual respect in the relationships really helps build your confidence um, you know, now sitting where I am as a project manager, I'm able to call contractors that I've, I've met throughout my years in the field and ask them questions and vice versa. And that to me has helped me build my confidence because I know I can ask them questions and they call me and ask me questions too. That's great. No, I really, that's a great answer in terms of 
you know, asking questions. I think that is important. Because I think sometimes <clears throat> younger engineers especially can think, you know, if I ask a question, it might be like a sign of weakness. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, which I understand. But at the same time, like you said, you know, it allows you, if you're open and honest, it allows you to build good relationships with people. You know, listen, other people are going to be more experienced than you at this point in your career. And you need to kind of leverage some of their knowledge as well. And, and, and I think that they will appreciate that. And then I think on the flip side too, if you get nervous about asking questions, which you shouldn't, you maybe get more comfortable over time. I do also recommend really becoming knowledgeable in that project the best you can before you go out in the field, meaning reading the specs, taking a look at the plans, so that at least you understand the technical aspects of it. Now you might get out in the field, you're still gonna have questions. Uh, like Danielle said, you know, what do you think's going on here? Are we hitting bedrock? That's not something you're gonna find in the plans, but the more you know about the project on paper, it will also help you to be able to pull some things into your mind and feel more confident. And Danielle, Absolutely. Danielle, you seem like a very confident professional. Have you been someone who's been confident like your whole life or is that something you've cultivated? Um, I would say it's something cultivated. Uh, it's, it's one of those things uh, where you, you can pretend to be confident even if you're nervous about something. Um, it's really how you portray yourself. You know, I, I definitely get nervous presenting, going out in the field, doing a new design calculation. But as long as you present yourself as confident, it kind of instills the confidence in you. Um, and I, I think it's important to re remain confident while you are, are working on things uh, because you're going to perform better. You know, if, you, if you're always questioning yourself in a negative way, not in a positive way, because I think it's important to question yourself and, and question the work that you do. But if you're always questioning yourself, saying you're not good enough, you're not going to produce the best work. You need to be confident and, and know that, um, again, you, you have your degree for a reason, and it's really just about continuously learning and figuring out how to be the best that you can be. Yeah, for sure. And I think that confidence also does come with you know, repetition, right? So the more projects you work on, the more field visits, you got to kind of push through those early field visits, ask a lot of questions. You may be uncomfortable, but over time, it's just going to become more and more comfortable for you because you're doing it over and over and you're building up more knowledge around it. So I do think, and I agree with Danielle, I mean, it really instilling that confidence in yourself is going to help you to instill confidence in others on these projects, but you know, you have to kind of keep doing it. Danielle, mentoring is something that is important to you. I know that you're a big believer in having mentors throughout your career. What have you learned from mentors in your career that have been helpful, that has been helpful to you? I would say probably the biggest thing is you're not expected to know everything when you start or when you graduate. This kind of goes back to being out in the field and asking questions. You are not expected to know everything. So ask questions. Um, there is going to be a learning curve starting your career, no matter what path you take. There's, there's always a learning curve. Um, I think being at a university, it, it does a really great job of teaching you how to think and think critically and the different facets of engineering, but really you get into the thick of it when you start your career. Um, specifically for me in waterfront design, you know, I mentioned that structural and geotech uh, is a large portion of the work that I do. But there's really no classes on, you know, port engineering and port facilities and the different types of structures that you'll see, the cranes and all that stuff. You, you might get a few specific graduate classes, but you learn most of that stuff on the job. Um, so I would say just when, when you start off, um, find a good mentor. You're, you're not going to know everything, but if you continue to ask questions, you're going to get there. Yeah, that's great. And I think you make a great point in that the more niche of a field you get in, like for example, port engineering, I think it's almost, I mean, it's always important to have a mentor, but having a mentor in such a niche field is, can really help you to build knowledge, build expertise in that field. And that's what I always recommend to engineers is when you're going to find a mentor, try to find someone in your very specific niche, if you can. I mean, it's worth the extra time and effort to do that because that's exactly what you want to learn. <clears throat> They've got that experience. So it really can be, be very helpful. And so, on that topic, Danielle, I know that you developed a crash course called Port Engineering 101. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, like I said, you, you don't really learn everything that you need to know for your job uh, at school. So one of the organizations I'm involved in, ASCE, so American Society of Civil Engineers, it's something that a lot of students do, the Concrete Canoe Competition, that translates into uh, a professional society. And there's different institutes 
Um, one of them is COPRI, the Coast, Oceans, Ports, and Rivers Institute. And essentially, the, the industry recognized that there is a big gap in knowledge between universities and the, the port and maritime industry. So what they did is they created a guided online course uh, to, to help uh, lessen that gap in knowledge. So you, you go on there and you can take a 12 week course and learn what you need to know to become a port engineer. Um, so what I had done is uh, I recognized that maybe we can go even further and provide a crash course. So for the Ports 19 uh, conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2019, I decided to do a port engineering 101 course. Um, I will say the reason I was able to pull this together is because I have a lot of great mentors in the field who helped me do it. So number one reason why you should get a mentor is, is they're able to help you out and really guide you um, on how to do things. But what we had done is we created a four hour short course, um, basically everything you need to know, very condensed on how to become a port engineer. So that includes um, vessels, that includes geotechnical engineering, seismic, port structures, uh, material types, construction documentation, all condensed into four hours. So it's, it's really meant for people who are starting out in the industry, people who have assumed a new role, um, or just for students to try and get them excited in port engineering and to, um, to bring them into the field. That's wonderful. I mean, for a lot of reasons, but I think one of them being just awareness around your discipline, because I going into school, let's say as a civil engineer, the odds of someone saying, you know, I'm planning to go into port engineering are probably low just because of lack of awareness and education around it. In fact, most civil engineering students that I talk to tell me that they want to be structural engineers. I think just because it's something they hear about more. I mean, I thought that myself and I didn't, I didn't ultimately become a structural engineer, uh, but it was what I knew when I went into school. So I think the fact that you're creating a resource that can educate people about another profession, another, uh, you know, component of civil engineering is super valuable. <clears throat> but I also think that when we talk about this in our courses, you know, building expertise in your career is important and building courses and being involved with courses and educating people about your profession is a great way to stand out in your career in terms of, you know, your company seeing you really being a leader in the industry, other people seeing you as being a leader in the industry. And also like we talked about earlier, building your confidence. And so I think it's great you're doing that for many reasons. And those are just a couple of them. And I guess one follow-up question that I had to that is, you know, obviously in recent history with the weather patterns, you know, we've seen, you know, a lot of hurricanes and flooding. Do you think that that will impact the interest level, the number of engineers interested in port engineering? Are, you know, is it related? Is that how, like, have you seen anything related to between that? Absolutely. Um, I chose to become a civil engineer because I, I wanted to work on the water, but I wasn't really sure what type of application or or how to go about doing that. But I remember specifically seeing a photo of a wind turbine and thinking that's the kind of stuff that I wanna work on. I, I wanna work on the water and I know that we're, we're facing some big hurdles as a society and you know, as we, we need to figure out how to combat those. So I think that the short answer is, is yes, it's going to get people interested. Um, and if, if it doesn't, then, you know, 30 years down the line, once we really start seeing the effects, you, you can see the effects in places like Boston right now where the tide is a lot higher. You know, you have a king tide and the water comes over onto the street. Um, but 30 years from now, you're absolutely gonna gain more interest. But I, I hope that we can get the word out now with these courses and with these conferences, get the word out now so we get the expertise and the interest in the, in the field now so that we can try and combat it before uh, we really start seeing the effects in a negative way. That's great. All right. And, and Danielle's covered quite some interesting points here today. We've talked about, you know, building confidence. We've talked about her journey as a woman in civil engineering. We've talked about mentoring, internships, lots of really, really good stuff. And I'm going to ask you to stick around. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back in a minute. And we're, uh, we're going to put Danielle on the civil engineering hot seat to wrap this one up and just pepper her with a few last career related questions. Stick with us. All right, we are back with Danielle Goodrow from Collins Engineers. And Danielle, we're going to put you on the civil engineering hot seat. You ready? I'm ready. 
All right. First question for you. Are there any specific rituals that you practice every day? For example, do you have a specific morning ritual or a lunchtime ritual, something that you do consistently on a daily basis that has contributed to your success? I think it would be making sure I wake up early enough to have a cup of coffee, uh, digest the morning and go through my emails, probably about an hour, I would say, just making sure I have enough time in the morning so that I, I'm not rushing to get to work. Um, but aside from that, in the morning, I, I would say that working out has been um, a huge thing for me, just exercising, whether it's a brisk walk outside, it was really nice in the summertime doing that, maybe not so much in the wintertime, um, but doing some sort of exercise uh, has really helped me. Um, actually, one, one other thing too, I would say is like, not just a routine right now, uh, but being spontaneous has helped, uh, especially for those working at home. I've been working from home for a while now, so having a routine, uh, while it's it's great and it's helped me um, professionally, it can be a little monotonous right now, just waking up, going to work, and then ending work and being in the same house. So doing things like today, I'm going to walk and go get some lunch. Being spontaneous has helped. That's great. No, I mean, you know, I didn't really think about that. You know, we've all been kind of working from home more than ever, and I think I'm a big proponent of structure and routine, but I can see certainly how getting off of that every so often, especially right now, could be helpful. All right, next question, Danielle. What is one book that you might recommend to our listeners or just one book that you have found to be helpful either in your personal or professional development that you could share? Um, so I think I would like to say rather than just one book, um, digesting podcasts and TED Talks has really been great. So rather than just one book and one topic, it's, it's one series or um, multiple topics that really just get you to think creatively and think critically about the world issues that we face. That's great. And I think that's the great thing about different content avenues is that everyone likes to take information in, in different ways. Some people walking and listening, some people reading a book and, and that, and the, we have the ability to do that now, which I think is, is, is powerful. So Danielle, thinking about the managers that you've had so far in your career and, and certainly no need to name anybody, but just thinking about them, if you think of some of the favorite, your favorite managers that you might've had so far, whether it was in your job or your internship, what are some of the characteristics that made them your favorites? Or, you know, what were some of the characteristics of the managers that you liked working for? I think trust is a big one. Um, someone who gives you the opportunities to challenge yourself and also trusts you to figure out the problems that they give you. I think within civil engineering or, or any field really, uh, as you move up, it, you, it can be easy to say to yourself, oh, well, it's just easier for me if, if I do it. Yeah, I'm gonna get it done faster if I do it. But having a manager that continues to give you increasingly difficult tasks and entrusts you to complete them, um, maybe it's something you've never done before. I, I think that's a great quality and, and I, I've had the opportunity to do that. And I think it's really helped me professionally. That's great. All right, Danielle, we've got one final question for you. We call it the civil engineering career elevator advice question. So if you got into an elevator with a civil engineer and you had about 30 to 40 seconds with him or her, and you had to give career advice in that short period of time, based on your career to date, what would that advice be? Set short-term and long-term goals. I think it's important to have a long-term goal to kind of direct your career path. And you know that can always change, but create some short-term goals too. I'm a very goal-oriented person. So it, it's, it's nice meeting those milestones and getting the gratification that I, I was able to complete this task and, and make to this goal. But also just don't beat yourself up if, if you don't get there in the time frame that, that you wanna get there. Everyone, goes at a different pace, especially right now, um, with everything going on. I don't, don't beat yourself up if, if you're not meeting the timeline that you had anticipated. Um, I would also say find your passion and what drives you in your career, whether that's trying out new internships, um, trying new facets in the engineering field, asking to try new projects or go out in the field a little more, but also find your passion in your personal life. Um, I think you can get it can be easy to get consumed with work and I've been there where I, it's, it's difficult to find a work-life balance and you can sometimes get consumed with work, um, but that's not necessarily going to move you up faster. You need to be happy and you need to find a good balance between your personal and pro professional life. Yeah, that's, that's great advice, especially 
when you work from home a lot, it becomes even more difficult to have that separation between work and life, which to your point, you need that really to be able to succeed. It's not an equation. It's not a simple engineering equation where if you work more, you'll do better at work. It's not necessarily the case. You need to, you need the breather, you need the rest, you need the relaxation. So Danielle Goodrow, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the civil engineering podcast. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was great talking to you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast on YouTube produced by the Engineering Management Institute. We're always looking for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.